the Liberty Meat Solutions podcast is all about food freedom and finding ways to provide for you and your family outside of the system, how to raise and process your own meat and not rely on others to do so. Thanks for listening, and I hope that you enjoy. Hey, what's up? Anyway, sorry, don't mind me just being weird. Uh, anyways, folks, here I am again, mobile from the car, so I have enough of a data connection to actually put out a live broadcast. Uh, apparently, my Telegram stream isn't going to work today. I don't know why. I'm going to go ahead and drop it off, and we're just going to go from there and see. Uh, maybe I'll figure out how to fix it in the future. I don't know. Uh, I've got an uh, episode today stacked up for you. We're going to see how this goes. Uh, I haven't ever sat down and done one where I have this many notes or things to talk about, but we want to actually put out one that's going to be you know, pretty beneficial and useful today. So uh, don't mind me as I get my stuff together here anyway. Well, thank you for joining me on the show. This is the Liberty Meat Solutions Podcast. You are in Liberty Meat Live. Anyways, this is going to be, I believe, episode 11. And we're going to start a multi-part series. This is going to be part one of uh, planning slaughter of larger livestock at home. We've done a lot lately talking about poultry, talking about uh, rabbits, smaller stock, because that's an easy thing for people to get into when they are just starting out. When this is something that you're just learning or just wanting to get into, maybe if you have a small space, you may be limited to small livestock. But a lot of folks, maybe they're already established in the country, maybe they're looking to go that direction, see the benefit of large livestock, ruminants are excellent for restoring, uh, restoring land and for permaculture and probably the most efficient use of livestock as a way to feed humans. So there's a lot going for them. Um, and I don't want to neglect that. That's also my wheelhouse, uh, coming from the background of working at a small brick and mortar processor, including and up to Texas state inspection, which was equivalent to USDA inspection. I'd have to work on slaughter days with an inspector directly beside me. Uh, learned a lot about that, all the ins and outs. Um, so after literally having, you know, put down and processed thousands of animals in a professional capacity and then bouncing out and ending up uh, doing it as a consultant and as a processor before the state decided to throw me a monkey wrench, uh, you know, mobile showing up in people's backyards. I've learned a lot of ins and outs and lots of uh, things that you want to either avoid or the best practices for interesting situations. Uh, I was told by a former coworker at one point that uh, my superpower is pulling things out of my ass, basically improvising. And he's right in a way. Uh, I was always the one to not say, no, we can't do this. I'm the one to go, how can we? What do we got to do? It's got to get done. What do we got to do to make it happen? So let me get back to my notes here and let's see, make sure we don't miss anything. Um, I got contacted the other day by uh, one of the folks over at Odyssey. There was an, a video upload issue uh, from one of my videos that live streamed and I, I had no idea about it. Well, he uh, left me a comment and said, hey, uh, do you want us to try to re-upload this or, or what do we want to do? You can just send a CMP4 file. We can try to get it you know, synced up. And I said, honestly, the easiest thing would be if I could sync it to my YouTube. But I can't because I don't have 300 followers on YouTube yet. And that's the minimum for Odyssey to sync. And uh, he said, well, I mean, if you want, we can try to push that through. I said, well, that'd be great. And he said, all right, well, the only thing is we got to delete the channel and resync it. And if you want to go ahead and do that, we'll, we'll get it all set back up. Okay, well, so you just go ahead and delete it. That's fine. He goes, well, the beauty of it, the beauty of Odyssey is it's all decentralized. He goes, we can't. You have to delete it. Uh, we, we don't even have the capability. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, I'll, I jumped over, did that real quick. They hooked it up, set it up. It is all synced with YouTube. So everything that is on YouTube should go there. So if YouTube ever decides that they don't like what I'm doing, well, it's going to be backed up on Odyssey. And that is... Uh, major benefit i think so anyways folks uh check it out it's uh at liberty meat over there on odyssey i do have it linked in the show notes um i should have it linked on the audio side i do apologize to the audio folks today 
I am going to try to get everything. I'm going to try to describe everything the best that I can as I go. It's a pretty visual episode. Uh, well, there's going to be a lot of links. You can probably figure it out from there. But I'm going to try not to just give visual demonstrations and not describe them. It's 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 new to me to do this whole le- like live thing and then do the audio side. So we'll see how that goes. Um, also, uh, on top of that, go ahead and make sure you follow me on that Odyssey account. If you can, it does help me out. But more so, if you follow me over on YouTube, that does help me out quite a bit. If we can get enough of those followings built up over there, I could eventually monetize it. But it just makes it, uh, it the more people that follow me there, the more it puts me out there, the more it recommends me. So I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of YouTube overall and their platform, but it is where everybody is. And it's, uh, it's a good way to get this message out there. So, um, if you missed it, uh, if you're at all familiar with anything going on in this space, uh, Jack over at the survival podcast actually had me on his episode on Wednesday. It was episode 3110. I've got that linked in the show notes as well. Go ahead and check that out. Me and Jack sat, we, darn near two hours we sat and uh and babbled uh, well we had to cut ourselves off from talking bitcoin right before the show and then a little bit after but uh, we talked about decentralizing meat processing and a lot of what i do where i came from this podcast stuff like that it was a great episode he had a lot of, of fun stuff to weigh in on he's a great guy uh fun to hang out with and uh, he's, he puts out some really really good uh, information so if you're interested in homesteading getting your life together trying to keep things uh rolling trying to Find ways to improve your life, even though things are kind of going to hell in a handbasket. He's a great guy to listen to. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, He's real with you, and uh, he's he's, they're all about solutions. So that's what we're about here, too, and we're going to try to keep that train rolling. Um, On top of that, Sunday evening, tomorrow night, that will be uh, June 26th of this year, 2022, if you catch this later on. Uh, and you can always catch the rewind on that, though, too, if need be. But it'll be live on YouTube, and I'm sure it'll be up on his podcast as well. Tim Cook from uh, Toolman Tim's The Workshop. He is going to have me on there, uh, interview me, talk about my background and what I got into, talk about meat processing. His, uh, his, I believe his dad actually used to be a meat cutter, so uh, he has that background, and uh, it's going to be an interesting thing. It'll be the first time I've been on an interview with someone from Canada. So uh, Tim's cool. He's a good friend, and... Uh, He's got a great podcast, pretty good following over there. Super cool, dude. You should check him out. But uh, definitely check him out tomorrow evening. It's going to be 8 p.m. Central Time. On top of that, Tuesday morning, we we got a busy week coming up here. Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. Central Time. I'm going to have Chef Keith Keith Snow. Let me not stumble over my tongue here. Chef Keith Snow. And uh, if you don't know him, he's really into the whole uh, basically farm to table movement, localized food. He has been for a long time. He's been on, uh, I think he still is on uh, Jack Spearco's uh, expert council with the survival podcast. Uh, and he does a lot with uh, cooking, seasoning, local foods. And uh, he saw, uh, yeah, sorry, man, I can't speak today. He saw my episode, uh, my interview on Jack's podcast and uh, reached out to me and said, Hey, I'd love to be on your show. Surprised the heck out of me. He's got a Real big following. He's been on cable TV. He's been uh, in like Prevention Magazine. So, yeah, you're more than welcome to come on the show. We'll, we'll sit down and chat. So, that's going to be really, really interesting there. So, uh, if you guys have any questions beyond what I cover on the podcast, if you have an immediate need, anything else going on, if you need some consultations, anything like that, email me uh, at josh at libertymeat.solutions. If for some reason you use Proton Mail and it doesn't like to look at the dot solutions uh, address, you can uh, get a hold of me. Just shoot me a message on Telegram or something like that. I'm not hard to find. You can find me at Liberty Meat uh, Solutions on Telegram. Uh, anywhere else, you go to live.libertymeat.solutions. Find all the ways to contact me. Just get in touch with me. And uh, if you've got something going on, we'll get you hooked up. We'll get you going. Um, on top of that, we are still doing renegadebutcher.com. Uh, we're trying to launch those special lines of spices, my recipes. We're going to get that going. We've also got a bunch of merchandise, a bunch of food freedom merchandise. I don't have the flag up behind me today like I did during Jack's show and the other night. But, uh, yeah, there's a ton over there. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Flags, t-shirts, hats, coasters, freaking cutting boards, you name it. There's all kinds of fun stuff over there. It's a great way for you to be able to support the show if you're interested in that. And that's all going to help 
either keep the uh, the websites and stuff online or going towards getting these seasonings launched and ready to go. We're also doing a membership program over there. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, we've already got some traction on that. Uh, I'm doing a lifetime membership option. I'm only I'm capping it at 100 members. After that, it's done. If there ever is another lifetime membership, it's not going to be as prestigious as this. It is the original, the OGs, the VIPs. It comes with all kinds of cookies. You get like 20% off free shipping for life, a couple uh, packs of spices every year forever. You could pass it to your heirs. I'm going to lose money on the deal in the long run, but it, it it's all in an effort to get this stuff off the ground and get it rolling. Um, plus, like, you know, you'll be the ones to get stuff first, access to things before anybody else, weighing in on opinions on next things to get launched, you know all the stuff basically a direct line to me but we're going to do some yearly memberships as well if you're just really interested in supporting what we have going on and you want to jump in and uh, have some extra cookies beyond you know just a discount or something like that uh, it, it's a good way to go um, we've got a yearly membership for 25 gets you a packet spice a year plus 10 percent off everything uh there's one that is for 50 you get two packs of spice plus 15 percent off everything so there's a lot going that direction, um, but go check it out if you want to, renegadebutcher.com. There's a lot of fun merchandise up there. I mean, some interesting things. If you don't want to buy it, you'll at least laugh at it. So there's that. Um, but I'm also starting to really kind of push, not really push, but utilize some of these affiliate links. I've got, a, on this episode particularly, I've got a lot of different products that I can recommend or point you towards if it's something that you're looking for. I'm never going to recommend a product that I either haven't bought, wouldn't directly buy because I have an experience with it, or, you know, I think it's the best deal for you in uh, an entry-level type situation. Uh, it basically, I'm not going to go out and just chill for money. If there's something, and there will be in future episodes, if there's something that I don't get any kickback from the manufacturer or the sales team website whatever if i'm not making money on it and it's a better product than what i could make money on it that's what i'm going to recommend uh, i the way i looked at it I, I don't want to commercialize everything but if i'm going to recommend you a product anyway and it doesn't cost you any extra i'll get a cut for it it'd be stupid for me not to so i'm trying to set myself up for that there are some Amazon links and things like that. I think we've got a spammer over on the Telegram group. Let me double check. Yeah, it looks like we do. Hey, look, let's go ahead and get rid of you. Delete all of your stuff. Report that as spam and get rid of it. Sorry about the delay there, folks. We've been having a lot. The Telegram group, the Liberty Meat Chat, if you haven't been over there, has picked up quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, we've got... Uh, of course, along with anything else on Telegram, we get the spammers that comes up. It's just a part of it, I guess. Anyways, let me pop back over, make sure there's nobody on chat that is trying to hit me up here. We're going to go ahead and run our banner on the bottom as well. Sorry, podcast listeners. It's uh, it, This is all still fairly new to me, so we're getting it figured out. I don't think we have anybody live watching yet. I kind of picked a weird time. It's about lunch on a Saturday. But that is fine. Let's see. Jump back over here and catch up on the notes. Where was I? But yeah, as far as the affiliate stuff, um, not going to recommend anything just to make the money off of it. But I'll, I will recommend. I will include those affiliate links if that's something that I would buy anyway. And if you want to support what I'm doing, that's a great way to do it. If I do appreciate that. If you follow the affiliate links, I'm going to have them on the YouTube. I'm going to put them up in the Telegram later. And I'm going to include them on the show notes for the audio side of things. Uh, if you are looking to buy something and you follow those affiliate links, I believe just following them and then buying anything else at that particular place will give me credit. But if not, you know, if you're looking at something in particular that you want to buy that is kind of in this space and uh, you'd like to help support the show without it costing you any extra, well, let me know what it is. And if I can do it with an affiliate link, I've got a pretty broad network that I signed up with of different uh, retailers that I can uh, give links for and potentially either get a, you paid just to click on it or much better, a percentage of the sales that, oh, sorry, that goes into my, you know, straight to me. There's no reason not to do so. So um, if, if you're interested in that, if there's something you're looking for, something you're hunting for and, you know, you just want to kind of help support the show, let me know. 
if I, I can manage to make that work, I'll definitely go out of my way to do that. So, um, well, that said, today, today, I want to focus specifically on the slaughter of large livestock. And that's a, that's a difficult topic for me to just talk about and just do. I'd love to be able to sit down and show you. Uh, however, I don't have access to something like that to do it at the moment. And if I did, uh, unless I was doing it with my own animals on my own property for my own purposes, it would currently, according to the state of Texas, be not permissible for me to do. So the last thing I'm going to do is do that and put it on video, put it on YouTube and end up in jail. So let's not do that. Um, we're working towards having the full state licensed mobile processing unit, which will allow me to do that legally for multiple individuals. And I'm going to be videoing that and, and showing for you guys yourselves at home because we're talking about you for your own use, which is a different ball game than me doing it for other people professionally. So, uh, but we're going to take my experience and uh, what I know and throw that out there. So let's see here. Where did I go? All right. As far as large livestock goes, I would break it down into about three different categories, even though it can be quite broader than that. But roughly, you've got goats and sheep, you've got swine, and you've got cattle. Now, goats and sheep could include anything else smaller. I mean, if you are raising some sort of small version of exotic deer, antelope, or whatnot, you're able to legally process it, whatever. You know, that falls in that same category. They're small ruminants. Um, swine are going to be any kind of pig, any kind of pork. And then you've got cattle. And cattle, I would include things like water buffalo and larger livestock. And I don't know where you are regionally or whatnot. I've not done one myself, but things like horse would be any kind of equine would fall underneath that large ruminant animals. We're going to talk about uh, the fact that there are lots of considerations when you're dealing with these to slaughter them. It's not quite like you never want to have to do it as an afterthought. You never want to have to do it in an emergency. Emergencies do happen, but this is a large project. It's a large job and you want to make sure that you have everything lined up and ready to go before you do this. If there's an emergency situation, that's a different, a different uh, ball game altogether. Uh, and you've kind of got to improvise and hopefully I will be able to help people prevent any catastrophes by listening to this series of podcasts. Now I'm going to say this is going to be broken down into several episodes because I, I plan to do this all as one. I got ambitious and yeah, that's not going to happen. Once I realize the breadth of the topic I'm going to have to cover, you know, for me, what I do in five, 10 minutes, I could probably talk about for hours to describe to you all the ins and outs and probably still miss some things that I'm not considering because it's not the same thing when you're doing something professionally and you're used to doing that day in and day out and you have to sit back and think, huh, uh, what am I, what am I forgetting? Guarantee you, you're going to be forgetting some things. Hey, Clay, I just saw your uh, comment over there. Sorry, about 15 minutes ago. He says, ew. I'm not sure what he was ewing about. It was probably my uh, weird intro. But anyways, uh, glad you made it. Glad you, you tuned into the stream. Um, anyways, let's get back to the main topic here. So there is a ton that can go into this. You don't want to just pull it out of your ass. You know, I want to be clear on this. This is part one. Today, we're probably only going to cover the actual slaughter portion. And from there, once you slaughter the animal, you still have to worry about what do I do with it? You've got to consider getting the animal skinned. You've got to consider breaking it down, you've got to consider cooling. You've got to consider what you're going to do after that initial initial moment there. And there's just not going to be time. It's going to be too overwhelming. There's going to be too much to try to break it all down and put it into one episode. So today we're covering the very basic, the first steps. Now don't go out, please, and shoot a cow or any other animal without a plan, without knowing where to go next to go, Okay, we're going to wait on Josh's next episode. Please don't do that. Please, please don't. I, I, I think I have confidence that everybody in this audience knows better than that, but I'm putting this out before the world. So 
please. I at least let us get to the point where you have the animal safely in a cool, you know, chilled situation before you go out and do anything. Uh, because I am going to break this out over time. I have a lot going on. I don't know the frequency of these podcasts yet. So if you are in an emergency, if you're in need of dealing with something immediately, you can contact me and I will hopefully be able to talk you through this, give you the cliff notes, do a consultation, something, help you out. Just know this is the first step in getting this process done. There is a lot to it. So um, I will say, I will caution before we really get too far into this, look into your local legalities. Um, I'm not going to tell you to try to do everything by the books and by the law. I will say, know what that is in your area. If you are going to try to do things, just, just go out and do it yourself because your local laws are ridiculous. Well, that's on you, but you should be aware of what you're getting into before you do it. Now, I think most states are similar to Texas in this regard, but I'm not going to guarantee it. I'm not a lawyer. I am not a legal counsel. What I tell you is just my own basic advice based on my experiences, and you should do your own research. You should always do your own research. Don't just listen to me ever. But in the state of Texas, there is an exemption to the state health department's, you know, edicts on how you must handle your own food. Uh, I get it. It's mostly about public safety. It's about being able to backtrack and understand where things come from and what, uh, where the meat was originated, slaughtered, and everything like that. And, you know, if, if anything ever goes bad, it's good to be able to know that. But when you're dealing with direct for the farmer, when you're raising your own animals, it's a different ball game. You kind of have, the onus is on you to make sure that things are done safely. So uh, as far as personal use, your own property, your own meat, it never leaves. Well, that's basically considered uh, part of a personal use exemption where the state has no jurisdiction to inspect. So um, do your own due diligence on whether or not that's legal where you are. I do believe it is legal everywhere else. And if it's not, it should be. Moving on from there, though, I think your first big consideration, other than having the animal, obviously, to process and having it to the point where you are happy with the results and you think you're, you're confident that it's where you want the animal to be as far as, you know, finishing it out, getting it ready to go. That's beyond the scope of today's topic. Um, I am not an expert on all things livestock and raising them, but I can pretty much most of the time tell you looking at an animal if it's something I would go ahead and go forward with killing. If you are not sure, and if you have, I, I you know, need advice on that, shoot me a message. I'm not going to say that I'm going to be able to have the answer for you, but I may be able to uh, find somebody who does or point you in that direction. But containment is going to be a huge issue. Um, it's going to be your first real big step. You don't want to have to go and chase an animal out in the middle of nowhere, out in the open. You do not want to have to do a long shot on an animal. It's not ideal. Sometimes things happen. It should be a last resort. Sorry if that's a little bit loud in the background. My I'm running on the cars. I've got an inverter going on in here and sometimes the fan goes off. So if there's a whine in the background, that's why. Apologize to the audio side. If that is the case, I won't know until I go back and listen. But anyways, um, it sounds cruel to people who aren't aware of how to deal with livestock or you've never been in that situation or you've not dealt with large animals, but confine it to the smallest pen possible. Ideally, if it's large, if it's cattle, put it in a squeeze chute. You want it. The best thing would be at least confined in something where it can't turn around. It can't move around. It can't be bouncing all over the place where you don't have to sit there and try to cherry pick a shot. That is going to be extremely difficult. We don't want to have to take a second shot. We don't want to have to have a backup plan or second shots or second chances when it comes to an animal. Because if there is one thing I firmly believe in, it's that if we're going to raise an animal, we're going to take its life. We're going to eat it. We're going to consume it. It's on us to do the best job that we can. And to do that, to be as humane as possible, 
we need to make sure we control the situation as much as possible to avoid negative outcomes. And I will say from personal experience, both in a professional controlled environment and in backyards and whatnot, things can go wrong. Things will go wrong. And don't kick yourself too much if they do, but do everything in your power from the get-go before you ever consider doing a slaughter to make sure that it's going to go right. The number one thing you can do is make sure that animal is gun find as much as possible because shot placement matters, seriously matters because shooting an animal is hard. And even if they are right there, even if you are close up, they're moving around, they're moving their head. They are, you know, there's a lot of factors you can't control. So control all of them that you can, not to mention the fact that if you have not done this a lot, if it's not something you're used to, and even more so if you have a connection with that animal, if it's something you've raised or whatnot, you're probably going to have all these emotions and thoughts and feelings going on. You're going to be nervous. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot hanging on this. And you want to get it right, which is going to mean that you're under stress. And if you haven't practiced shooting animals in the face under stress, there's a lot that could happen. So tip the scales in your favor as much as possible. With cattle, I prefer a squeeze shoot. If I get a chance, I'll try to post some pictures up. But if you are, if you've worked with cattle, you probably know what I'm talking about. Some places call it a crush. That sounds horrible. It's not. Um, it's what you usually use when you're doing veterinary work on the animal, vaccinations, antibiotic injections, anything, draining an abscess, anything that goes wrong with that animal. When you're dealing with large livestock that can not only hurt you, but hurt themselves or other animals or whatnot because they're scared. A chute is a, a narrow hallway, basically, that the animal gets walked up into. And then that crush or that squeeze chute is uh, basically a small cage that's enclosed and there's often a bar that comes up and it's pressing on either sides of that animal's body and it's not doing it in a painful way, but enough to confine them and keep them from moving around and hurting themselves. And I feel while it sounds kind of cruel to confine the animal and everything like that, it'd be much better if it could die with its head in the feed bucket. If you're able to confine it, there's less that can happen to the animal and the things that can happen with a bad shot or a mistake can be far more painful, distressing, or cruel to the animal than being put in a small space right before it dies. So often animals are kind of like small children in that when you do put them in that confined space, they tend to calm down a bit too. So it's a weird psychological thing. We tend to anthropomorphize everyone and we see these animals as exactly like us. That's not always the case. So I think consider that con main consideration is putting it in that small pen that shoot whenever possible. When you're dealing with things like uh, goats and sheep, goats especially, I find they tend to be very animated, bouncing around, moving their head around a lot all the time. And uh, you won't see this on the on the audio side, of course. But, you know, if you're watching the video, you see me bouncing my head around. You know, if something is bouncing its head around, looking around and doing this, whatnot, and you're trying to get the exact right shot on what's going on. It doesn't matter if you're right there, it's hard to do. And the last thing you want to do is just start unloading on something and hope you kill it in a humane way. What I like to do with goats, sheep, anything like that, that's small, is I like to put it either in a halter or at least a rope around right underneath the chin, not choking it, but to confine firm, you know, and either if you've got it in a pen, that's great. Still, there's a lot of room for it to bounce around corner post, T post, something, tree, whatever you need. I prefer to tie them up tight against it, not in a painful way, but enough to keep them from moving around. Um, some other folks that I've worked with um, to do mobile processing, they'll uh, actually have a helper that will grab it, especially if it's got horns, great. You know, basically grab it by the head, hold it still, and they will do a shot. I, I typically would do a frontal shot, um, a shot from behind through the back of the head forward, will work as well especially on especially on something like the other sheep and uh, they would typically have someone hold it while they did the shot usually with a 22 pistol i'm not a huge fan of that especially if you haven't worked a lot with that individual i mean you've got a second person you have to really consider where their body is where the shot might go 
if they're not used to that, you guys better work really well to each other. If you're going to have somebody hold something while you shoot it, because you're going to be in close proximity. Don't shoot someone, please, please don't do that. You know, accidents happen. So I prefer to do the whole, whether you do a frontal or a back shot, I prefer to do the whole tie it up to a post type thing myself. Most of the time when I'm doing that, I'm working by myself in that situation too. Um, now, what if things go wrong? What if something goes bad? You know, what if things don't really play out the way we expect? Well, sometimes they don't. Every once in a while, your first shot doesn't uh, do the job. Maybe the placement was wrong. Maybe it was just an extremely hard-headed animal. Maybe there was some fluke. And who knows? There are times when things go wrong. So if that animal is in an enclosed area, it's generally not hard to get that second shot. And usually that's all it takes. If that animal was, you're, you're trying to be as kind as possible and you just have it in an open pasture yard, you set a bucket down, it's got its head in the bucket and it's eating nine times out of 10, that's gonna work. The times that it doesn't work, now you've got to chase that animal off to wherever the heck it went. Maybe very far from where you were planning on doing the job. Maybe you don't have a way to transport that animal. Maybe it's going to be difficult. Maybe it breaks through a fence, gets on a neighbor's property, and you are in a world of mess at that point. You may have an animal that is injured, in pain, stressed, dying on a neighbor's property, in an unideal area, or whatever, but now it's not going to let you close. So you're going to have to improvise. You're going to have to hopefully be a good shot. And now it's a whole different world. So we're going to bounce into that after a bit, too, and see if we can't... Uh, kind of cover how that works out. I think we're going to skip ahead here on things. If I can pull up, uh, be patient with me because I am still figuring out the StreamYard thing. I'm going to try to put on the screen, if possible, the uh, line this stuff up here really quick. Uh, some of these shot placements, where did I put it? Oh, no, maybe I didn't. Hold on. Give me just a second. Please be patient. Thank you for waiting. Um, I have a photo. I'm not even going to pull it up yet. I'll, I'll pull up some of the other stuff here in a bit. But uh, essentially, and I'm going to post a link towards a really good article in the notes. And uh, that should really help you. But shot placement is probably the most important thing when it comes to the actual slaughter. I, I'm going to be clear on the way that the USDA sees it, and I'm going to give my opinion on that. Uh, the way the USDA regulates it is that a shot, whether it is from a live round, whether it is from a bolt gun, uh, is considered stunning the animal. And the reason for that is because one shot to the brain, depending on where it enters the brain, where it goes from there, the individual animal and the fact that the world is a crazy place does not necessarily mean that the animal is dead. It means that it's unconscious. If it's done right, the animal should immediately lose consciousness, drop to the ground, and get ready for it because now's the time to exsanguinate, to bleed it. Be careful because that animal, those nerves are going to go off, it's going to kick, and it may hurt you in the process. That's how things are supposed to go, ideally. Uh, if what you did just basically render the animal unconscious and did not completely kill it, if it regains consciousness, it's going to obviously be confused and or in pain. So that's why we immediately want to do the bleed. Um, so they do not consider it dead in an official capacity until it is exsanguinated, until it is bled for good reason. Because if you do your job properly, once that animal drops, goes unconscious, and then you bleed it, it will bleed out before it could ever regain unconsciousness. And therefore, the animal is never going to be conscious and experiencing pain. We don't want the animal stressed because it will affect the quality of the meat, but also from an ethical and moral perspective, if we're able to do this without the animal being in a stressed, painful, fearful environment, let's do so. I mean, there's just because we are consuming that animal doesn't mean that we have to be cruel. We have a capacity as humans to be able to be more humane than any other species does. There are a lot of species out there that eat meat. And nature is cruel. I argue that the fact that we can do things in a controlled way and that we know scientifically the ways to do this to the best of our ability, we are probably more humane in our meat consumption than any other species on the planet. 
And I very much believe in that. So let's circle back around to the actual shot placement. On pretty much every large animal that you're going to process, the rule of thumb is to look at them if you're doing a front shot. And you want to take an X between the ears and the eyes. And that roughly is going to be, that centered on that X is going to be roughly where you want to put that bullet. Um, cattle, it's going to be a little higher than you'd think. If you look at them, they, they most of the time, especially if it's a horned animal, they've got a dome sort of on the head where those horns come out. There's a thick partition of bone. Just below that is the ideal spot for that bullet entry. And it should be right in line with that X between the eyes and the ears. Uh, if they don't, there's still a, a knob on that head where the horns would be if they grew horns. But without uh, studying kind of cattle anatomy and skulls and whatnot, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, if anybody's super interested, I will see if I can get some pictures of some cows that I have shot. Uh, I, I actually have some skulls around with bullet holes in them. Uh, I like to, I've sold a couple. I like to keep them around as, uh, you know, this is how you should do it. Educational examples. Um, the same goes for hogs. The same goes for sheep, goats, and everything else like that. What matters more, more, then where that shot actually goes is where it goes after it penetrates the skull. That is the ideal spot is generally the softest spot from the front side of the skull on most animals. You don't want to shoot it in the thickest part. You don't want to shoot it in the horn dome. You don't want to shoot it in nasal cavity, obviously. But, you know, where it goes after really matters more. The skull is just a bone. The brain itself, we want to actually do as much initial damage to the brain as we can in that instant because it's the best chance that we are going to render that animal unconscious immediately so you can hit it in the exact right spot but be way high way low on its angle the animal may have its head tipped in all different directions and uh, you may be ineffective it may just hit and glance off graze under the skin cause that animal pain it may not actually hit the right part of the brain to render the animal unconscious. It may not. You want to knock that whole frontal lobe out and ideally all the way to that rear brain stem. You want that round to pass all the way through the brain. And we'll get a little bit more into the ballistics of that as we go on here. But so when you're taking that shot, take your time. You want that shot lined up perfectly when you pull that trigger. Don't be in a hurry and don't stress. Don't try to force the animal. Let them make up that mind. And typically, if you're calm and you're relaxed and wait, they're going to look straight at you and give you that opportunity. And that's what you're looking for. Um, if you are doing from behind, behind the head type shot on goats, sheep, things like that, that's different. Um, line that up. I like to use a rifle rather than a pistol in most cases because the rifle is going to have, for the same round, much higher velocity and uh, better ballistics to actually do what it's supposed to do. If you're now, keep in mind, goats and sheep are. Have pretty soft heads they're they're fairly small animals even a 22 lr will probably penetrate all the way through so that may be one reason you may want to use a 22 pistol because you actually want to slow that round down to add more damage to the brain maybe you want to use uh in that case if you're especially if you're not going through the front of the skull you may want to use uh an expanding round so there's no real super clear cut there but keep in mind that round's going to go somewhere so you also have to remember, if that round does exit that animal's head, where is it going? Is there anything, anybody, any, any, anybody that could be harmed in the path of that round behind the animal? Is If you're using a larger round than what I recommend, is that round going to pass through that skull and end up somewhere else in the animal? It's going to cause you problems later on in the slaughter. These are considerations that you need to think about. If you are doing a high shot, down low on an animal, even if it's the perfect shot, if that round exits its head and it hits concrete or steel, could it ricochet? Could it harm you or somebody else? These are things that you really need to consider. So if you have any questions on that, please let me know and I will answer the best of my abilities and try to give you the best safe practices that I can in those situations. Um, another thing that you can do, and this happens a lot with pigs, I've, I've heard it with cows as well. I think it's maybe a better chance or a better, uh, better option if you're using a large round, if it's what's available to you, or, uh, if you've got an animal that just will not give you the shot that you want is behind the ear. 
because uh, there's a soft spot. You can basically act, enter the skull without going through bone. Uh, however, at that, your shot angle is just as important, if not more important, than that case too. You, just because you shot him behind the ear does not mean it actually damaged the brain. So you need to make sure you are trying to go across the entire hemisphere of that brain with that round. Um, from there, let me see. I could go on forever. Let's see if I can check my notes, make sure I'm not missing anything. We're going to circle back to what rounds to use. Now, that is a big fat flying if it depends. It, there's, there's no clear cut answer here. And a lot of times the best round that you have is what you have and what you're most confident with. I will say that 90% of slaughters of domestic animals can and maybe should be done with probably the most available, cheapest round out there, the 22 LR. And the reason behind that is not only the fact that it is dirt cheap, it's easy to shoot, it's easy to learn on. Most folks are comfortable with it. Most folks have it around, it's available. And if you don't, we're gonna to try to help you out with that too. It's that it's a small, lightweight projectile that moves just slow enough that as long as it penetrates that skull, it tends to slow down and actually ricochet and bounce around inside the skull just a bit, which is will actually cause more damage to the brain pretty much instantly than most other rounds. Um, some other folks that I know use a 17 HMR. It's great. Uh, it is a very fast round. It's a hard hitting round for its tiny, tiny size. But I think you're more likely to have that go in and out, less bouncing. So I know some folks that use it pretty much primarily for even large cattle slaughter. And 90% uh, of the time, one shot drops. Ideal. It's great. Uh, if it's what you got, use it. I prefer 22 LR for most things. Now, I will say the caveat there. If it's all you got, it's great. There's, you may want to look at behind the head shot, behind the ear shot. If uh, you're dealing with a larger, older animal. Uh, for large things, bulls, maybe horned cattle, older pigs. Pigs, honestly, will cause you more problems than cattle. You may want to up the the ante a little bit uh where i used to work on the professional kill floor we only used 22 wmr 22 magnum and there were very very few times that we had any issue with that penetrating a skull uh, it's still small enough that if it does get out you're not a little bit less concerned than if you're using a large caliber round so you know there is the consideration of i'm in a steel room with a concrete floor if a round gets out it's going to go bouncing and I just hope it doesn't hit me. So we really wanted that round to stop within the animal's skull. Um, however, way overkill for something like goats or sheep, way too much. Especially if you're doing a front on shot, you are going to end up with that round going into the animal, probably popping a gut, which you're going to leave a mess for you when you get to the next big steps, which will be covered in later episodes. Uh, so yeah, there is that there. Um, but that's not the only options. Those are probably the best options if you ask me. If I'm going to deal with like an older cow, an old bull, or a big hog, I'm going to try to go with a 22 WMR if possible. Uh, or the next step up would be like a 410 slug because uh, it's going to be a big heavy hitting round that goes slow enough that you're not going to deal with over penetration as much, but you could. So I try to make sure that shot is going to be more, more high and down so that it's not actually going to go towards the torso of the body of the animal if possible. Um, some resources, some ideas there. Let's see if we can do a little bit of uh, sharing. Uh, most folks have a 22. Most folks have it around or they can borrow one. Uh, so I'm not going to go on forever about things like that. But let's see. Share screen. Let's share a window. Let's share a tab. Hey, here we go. So do, 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 do. I'm going to share these in the show notes. There's some resources here. Uh, as far as 22W or 22LR rifles. Let's see if it's showing on stream yard. Yep, there we go. Uh, Cabela's has some right up here. Uh, this is 279. It's a Ruger 1022. This is probably the most popular 22 rifle on the planet. Uh, I, I don't think there's actually one out there that has seen more use. Uh, this is a semi automatic. So if you need a follow up round, you've got it with a pull of the trigger. It's got a magazine. Uh, there are a million modifications and a million different uh, options. With this particular rifle, 
you can it's probably one of the most customizable rifles other than an ar-15 so it's great it's solid there is a ton of support and use out there for it um, i've got links up in the show notes for both cabela's and for bass pro shops i believe they're actually the same company now and if uh just find which one's local to you uh, they're the same price they're going for 279 right now you can probably find some cheaper you can probably find them cheaper in a pawn shop but if you feel like you want to spend the money on it and you would like to uh, go ahead and purchase one of these if you want to help me out go to cabela's go to best pro shop add it to your online cart buy it online i'll get some credit for it and a little bit of kickback uh but by all means don't go out of your way to buy something like that just because i said it um i think it's a good rifle I don't actually, just to be clear, personally own a Ruger 1022. Um, I have used them. I like them. I think they're a great uh, rifle. The 22 rifle that I use typically myself, oh, let's see, the 22 rifle that I typically use myself uh, is actually an old, it's a Marlin. Yeah, it's a Marlin, I believe. Uh, it's Woodstock. Tube magazine, 18 round tube magazines, uh, bolt action, but uh, it was my grandfather's and my uncle actually refinished it, re put a new stock on it and everything. So it's been passed down, it's been through the family. Uh, that thing has probably seen, it's probably killed more, taken more lives, we'll say, than most war rifles. I have killed a lot of animals with that 22 rifle and uh, it's, it's never let me down. So I love that. I'm never going to switch up from that unless I need to, or maybe one day I'll feel like I just want to put it on the shelf and let it retire. And if I did, I would be buying exactly that, a 1022. So rounds are cheap. When you can get it, ammo's cheap. You can stock up a lot of it. It's a great rifle to learn on if you have never shot a rifle before. It's probably where you should start. The recoil is minimal. It's an easy rifle to learn to be accurate with. You're going to learn all the good habits. So there you go. Um, but stepping it up to, as I mentioned, that uh, 22 Magnum. Let's see here if I can. Oh, let's, no, I want to stop the screen. Here we go. Let's share. Screen. Brave tabs. And all right. A decent 22. I have run across. This is also one of those Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. They both have them listed. This is a Savage 93F a 22 Magnum bolt action rimfire rifle. It is bolt action, but it does have a magazine. So you've got follow-up shots if you end up in a bind. And sometimes you do want to have that second shot. A lot of times I'll go ahead and put a second shot in just to make sure that everything's, you know, good to go. It makes me feel better. makes the customer feel better. And you, you don't have to worry that the animal is going to suffer. So having, there's a lot of single shot rifles out there. There's nothing wrong with them, but I don't want to have to take time if I need it for that follow-up shot. So I do like having that. Um, this Savage rifle is probably the cheapest you're going to find in Magnum right now. And I will say Magnum WMR ammo is a little bit harder to find. So I, I the only reason I actually have some on hand right now is I'm, one of my good dear customers is a firearms dealer and he will order stuff in. So he'll keep an eye out and, uh, you know, kind of hook me up when I need to. So I've stocked up on that a little bit. It does come in handy for work. Um, this particular rifle is also not one that I myself own, but it is, uh, the rifle that I used when I worked you know, on a commercial kill floor. This is, this is what I use. I, put down literally thousands of animals in close quarters with this rifle in a steel and concrete building. So it does the job. It really does do the job. If you do your work, if you do your part. So, Hey, scrambling gun talk. Yes. Good morning. Uh, gun talk and uh, the ways to use them and you know, all that fun stuff. So uh, glad you could join us. Just saw you, you stopped dropping the stream there. So uh, anyway, like I said, again, it's, they got Bass Pro Shop and Cabela's. I've got those links up there on YouTube and I'll put them in the show notes. So if uh, if you feel like you need to go buy this, go ahead, uh, pop in there, add it to your card online. I should get credit for it. But uh, don't go out of your way. I mean, check around, check pawn shops, check uh, stuff like that. There's a lot of guns out there for sale right now. And more than likely you or somebody that you know probably has what you need on hand. If you are raising livestock, you probably 
more than likely uh, have something that's going to do the job on hand. Let me go ahead and pop that back down and drop back to this. Um, now I'm going to go on to other rounds and things like that. I will say I carry myself, I carry a nine millimeter, um, a, a pistol, semi-auto pistol. I carry it around. I have it for self-defense and whatnot, but mostly I, I keep it out open carry when I'm out on the uh, property somewhere or dealing with a slaughter as it's a good handy backup and I've got quick follow-up rounds if need be. Uh, mine is um, a Taurus, a GC3. I'm not recommending that that's the only thing out there. The best thing, if you might have a Glock, you might have a 45. You know, a pistol like that, a center fire uh, pistol is a good backup. And some folks do use it as their primary slaughter method. Uh, just like some folks will use a closed bolt, uh, like some of the big processors. If you want to go buy one of those, that's great. I'm not going to recommend you a specific model. If you are looking at a specific one and you want like a referral link because you want to help me out, let me know. I'll see what I can do. But... The main thing with that is you have to consider the fact that your rounds very well may exit that skull and where is it going to go afterwards. So don't put yourself in a bind. Don't be shooting up parts of the cow that you're going to have to clean up later down the line. And I'm just speaking specifically on cattle. If you're dealing with something like a goat or a sheep, yeah, it's going through. Uh, older hogs or something like that, sometimes it's nice to have that little bit more punch just to know that you're going to get through that thick-ass skull. All things to consider. Uh, there's no super right or wrong answer. Now, I will say sometimes things do go wrong. Sometimes, especially if you're in a situation where you can't confine the animal. Maybe it's broke a leg. Maybe it's a downed animal. Maybe it's an animal that just will not come to a pen and you've got to deal with it. Maybe your first shot didn't work and it broke through a fence and now you are sitting here trying to like deal with that lump in your throat and I fucked up and I've got to deal with this. So this is why I always recommend if you are going to deal with especially the large livestock, have a backup option. Uh, my backup option is, I'm going to go ahead and share this. I'm not saying it is the only thing that you can do. But let me pull this tab up here if it will let me make sure it's still available there. Yes. Uh, what I use, I got this specifically as a deer rifle, um, but I use it more than I'd like to at work sometimes. There are some oddball situations I've been in, not per, not currently, but in the past. Um, this is a Savage Axis. I have it in uh, .30-06. You can get it in other calibers. Um, pretty much anything that's going to take out a deer. Uh, it's, it's what you want. Uh, this particular model that I've linked, and I, I posted the links as well, uh, it, this comes with a scope. It's a decent scope. It's a Zoom in and out, you get three to nine times with 40 type scope. Mine, myself, I've got a Barsco scope. I've got a, a different scope on there, one that has lighter reticles and things like that. I upgraded the scope uh, myself. It's my own personal preference. I'm not going to tell you what is or isn't right or wrong when it comes to a longer distance or a deer rifle. I mean, I if this was going to be the what's the right rifle to shoot something at a distance podcast, good Lord, we can go on forever, and I'm sure we have a bunch of haters. But uh, this is what I use. This is what I have. I'm confident with it. I'm confident with my ability to use it. I have dropped cattle in their track at up to 60 yards away with one shot with this particular rifle. Practice. Make sure your scope is on point. I will also say it is not a guarantee. I have been in situations where what is going on? Understand. Take some time to study the anatomy of the skull of that animal. Know what you're doing know how you're putting it down and know that if you're in this situation you don't want to ever take a shot with it where it's head on especially head down i have been in the situation before where i've shot an animal dropped it didn't realize the round literally went all the way down the throat popped a gut and was waiting for me with a mess so i prefer to actually go temple to temple right behind the eye and below the horns temple to temple side cross head shot when it comes to dropping a cow from a distance with a rifle like this so and, and I will say that generally is effective, but you also have to be very cognizant of where is that round going. Have a safe backstop. Don't go shoot your neighbors because you're out trying to drop old Bessie who's, uh, you know, stepped in a gopher hole and broke her leg. Uh, you have to be very, very careful in these situations. So that is what I use. Those links are up there. They are available. Uh, you do not have to use them. If you do, great. I might get a little kickback from it. Uh, however, and if you have any questions on these things, please reach out to me. Go join the Liberty Meat Chat group. Uh, email me, josh at libertymeat.solutions. Uh, 
find me anywhere. I am happy to help you and give you advice on this. Uh, it's a big thing, especially if you've never done it before. And there's nothing worse than screwing it up and having to, you know, to deal with that too, because it's uh, it's not a it's not a fun thing. It's not something we ever want to see happen. So do do the best that you can. Do your research ahead of time and be sure you really know what you're getting into. Um, there are people who make a living doing this and they've done it a lot and even they make mistakes. So if you are new to it, don't be surprised if you do make a mistake, but do everything you can to avoid it. Uh, but once you have shot that animal, as we've covered, once you have it down, it's going to drop down. That tells you you've done it the right way. The animal shouldn't be making a vocalization. Its eyes shouldn't be moving around. You know, you should be able to look at it. Its eyes will probably be open, uh, but those eyes should be glassed over, stay, pretty much stationary. There may or may not be any sort of breathing. Sometimes there may be an, uh, a groan or something like that because that animal, as it drops, those nerves are still going to be firing. Um, it will start seizuring soon. Don't be freaked out by that, but don't be in the way, especially with its, with a large animal like cattle. It may be immediate. It may take up to 10 minutes for that to happen. Uh, basically, it's all of the pent-up energy in the muscles is going to release. And that, uh, you know, those nerves are still firing just because you rendered it unconscious doesn't mean the brain is totally gone. The brain isn't doesn't have an on-off switch. It is its own fully functional organ, a bundle of nerves and fat that uh, you, you aren't, unless you hit that thing in the head with a grenade, it is not going to just be, you know, nothing is that simple. Death isn't a a finite thing, a definite black and white thing that we like to think of it. So um, just because that animal's unconscious doesn't mean that it's dead, dead, that it's gone, gone. Your job's not done. At this point, the best practice is to exsanguinate, to bleed it as quickly as possible because while that's still going on, while those muscles are still tense and kicking around and, you know, things like that, and that can be very violent, pigs, I've seen you know, be completely brain dead, but literally be kicking so hard. They're on their back, arching their back and coming two, three feet off the ground. Cattle, I've seen folks actually have their leg broken from a dead cow kicking them because it's sort of like a snake, a young baby snake. It, it doesn't know itself. It can't control it. It's more venomous than the adult because it injects everything. It just, ah, it goes. So... Those death throws can be deadly to you. Be careful. Don't get kicked. Don't get hurt. Don't get horned. Know where you're going to be. As far as bleeding it, location, I prefer to come in directly below the jaw, as close to the spine as possible, as deep and as possible, all the way through and forward. Now, you may or may not cut that jugular. You're going to cut it eventually. Uh, you may have ingesta, basically stomach vomit that comes out of that cut. If that's the case, typically anything below that portion of the neck is going to be trimmed in the final product anyway, but go in and bleed that both sides. If you can, if you can only access one side, that's, that's fine, but you want to cut that jugular, that artery, you want to cut all of the vascular system right there, because as that heart is still pumping, as those muscles are still seizuring, it's going to force as much blood as possible out of that animal. Ideally, in this situation, you want the animal hanging upside down while you do that. But unless you are rigged up with a hoist and everything right at that point, and you're able to get in there and do it safely without getting kicked, most folks aren't going to be able to pull that off out in a pasture. But get that blood, get that open, and then we're going to get hung up in following episodes shortly afterwards. And that's going to uh, facilitate that, that quick bleed out. Um, now, recommendations on what to use for that bleeding. A good sharp knife. It's preferably a long knife. I prefer a fixed blade knife. I don't want a folder in this situation. I don't want to deal with something that's going to potentially break on me, come off loose of a handle. I don't want questions. Um, I've used a couple different things. They're probably my favorite bleed knife ever. I can't find the link for it. I can't find where or how I ordered it, who I ordered it from. I'll have to do some looking. But it was actually a long, about, I think the whole whole dagger itself was about 18 inches, about a 12 inch knife or 12 inch blade, uh, double edged. And, uh, it did a great job, you know, I was just in and out. If I can find that again, I will share that link for y'all. Um, 
in the interim, though, what I've been using, what I uh, typically do use, and what I carry on my waist every day. I always carry two fixed blade knives on my on my waist because, well, my profession, it's my job. I I am uh, slaughtering animals for a living. So, uh, and you know, it, it, they're handy in a self-defense situation. I use them all the time and around the, the property if I'm hiking or whatnot too. But uh, I'd say what I typically use for bleeding, let me go ahead and pull one up here and I will show, I've got links for this as well, lots of links. Uh, this right here is buck knife, a buck 119 special. Um, blade could use a little bit of cleaning or whatnot. It's bled a lot of animals and uh, it's a, uh, a very solid knife. It's time tested design. Uh, the one I use is stainless steel. I like carbon steel knives uh, myself as far as the sharpening angle. I really do. Uh, but a good stainless steel knife for something that you just need it to be food safe and not be rusty, it's hard to beat. And I will say the buck knives do take a good edge and they will hold it for a good long time. They come razor sharp. Um, I have the links in the show notes for this. I have it from if you wanted to buy something there on Cabela's or Bass Pro or whatnot, that's fine or whatnot. But I've also got it linked on uh, on Walmart and Amazon. Uh, and any of those, if you follow those links, will keep going. It's not a cheap knife, though. It goes about $70 right now. Pretty much everywhere I've looked, it's $69.99 or $70. Um, so if you're investing in a good knife, that is going to be a good belt knife, a good bleeding knife, whatever, that's great. But it's not just for that. Um, a, a mobile butcher that I know actually uses it primarily for skinning and breakdown. That's like the knife that she goes to. And it's a good knife. It's great. It does the job. I like having different knives for different features and different different uses. But uh, it's definitely a great go-to. I have skinned all kinds of stuff with this knife. I have broken down all kinds. I could pretty much do an animal start to finish with this knife if I wanted to. I wouldn't recommend it, especially for somebody who's not uh, who's just learning the way through it and trying to learn the best way to do it. It's kind of big and clunky for certain delicate operations. But it's a thick, meaty, strong knife that is going to do exactly what you need when it comes to that bleed operation. Uh, removing, you know, uh, legs, dejointing animals. It's not a knife you're going to have to worry about shoving in the wrong spot and breaking the tip off. Unless you're, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I've never seen it happen. And in my experience, Buck does a pretty good job of uh, backing their product. Uh, they've been around a long time. So they, it's one of the few knives I would say is really worth the money. And I'll cover other knives and stuff in future episodes. Don't worry about that. That's definitely going to be something that we go over. So let me see. I think I can pull that up here in the video. I should have done that earlier. Let me pull up that screen here. I love that StreamYard lets me pull up different tabs. Yes, so this one's at Walmart. And uh, if, you, if you just want to go and buy this knife, and uh, you don't want to buy anything else and you just want to kind of help support the show. Oddly enough, if it works out, I'm still fairly new to it. But the affiliate links, I think Walmart actually pays me more than anybody else, which is crazy. So, uh, but check it out. I've got the Amazon link too. If uh, you feel like buying one of those other firearms that I mentioned because you're just that inspired by my words, uh, you go ahead and add one of these to your, uh, to your cart while you're at it and go ahead and do your online purchase. And uh, that'll help me out a little bit. I'm not telling you to do so. A good, any good, sharp, sturdy uh, knife that, that's not a folder is probably going to do exactly what you need. But if you're looking, this is a good one to get. So and it's one that I will, I mean, <laughs> I would put my life on that knife. Yes, if, if I'm ever in a shitty situation uh, and a physical altercation and somebody comes at to me and it is not a good situation that is conducive to me using a firearm because of, availability, situation, timing, they're right there. Who knows? They're probably going to deal with that knife, and I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of it. We'll put it that way. Um, I have a lot of experience with it. It's good in the hand. It's quick. It's it's it, it's just a good knife. So with that said, let me go ahead and wrap back up here with the final show notes. I have been rambling for the longest time. On what I got going on here. Let's pop up over here. Okay, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Make sure we've covered everything. We've done the stun. We've done the bleed. I don't mean to uh, leave you hanging. A uh, horrible, horrible joke there. But once we have this animal down, the next episode is really going to be getting that animal hanging. 
getting it dealt with and everything like that. There's just not going to be, I mean, we're already over an hour. There's not going to be time to cover that in this episode. And I want to be able to take the time to sit down and actually get things together on what equipment I have used personally. And I would recommend for you guys uh, if you're doing this stuff at home. So I'm going to put some more work into that next episode and make sure that it is top tier and ready to go and polished off before I go put that out. I don't want to half-ass these. I want to make sure I get everything as fleshed out as possible. Wow, there's another potential pun uh, for you all to make sure that uh, you get exactly what you should be getting from me. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and move on to as far as announcements. Let's see. Uh, be sure, I mentioned at the beginning, but be sure to check out tomorrow evening. That will be the 26th, if you're listening to this later on audio. Tomorrow evening, 8 p.m. Central, Tim the Toolman Cook is going to have me on his podcast. I'm going to be there live with him. We're going to be talking about uh, meat, meat cutting, and all that fun stuff. And then Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. Central, uh, should be, I think, the 28th, 29th, uh, we're, Chef Keith Snow is going to be on my show. We're going to be talking about these, you know, decentralized meat, uh, farm to table type stuff, local food. And uh, he's, he, I'm really excited to have him on the show too. He, he's been all over the place. He's uh, been on TV, he's been in magazines and everything like that. Uh, real professional chef. So I think uh, we're going to have a great conversation. We're, we're kind of coming at things from different places, but uh, with the same goals. So that's pretty awesome. Um, on top of that, uh, yeah, please, like I said before, go check out everything over at Renegade Butcher. Check out those memberships. Check out some of the merchandise. Um, it's a bunch of cool stuff going on, and hopefully I'll be able to have a bunch more of this stuff, these affiliate things uh, tied into the live that Liberty Meat Solutions as well. Uh, so, you know, like I said, those notes for the items I was recommended are going to be in the show notes. And they're going to be on the website as well. And if you are just hunting for something in particular and you want to be able to uh, kick some of that to me, let me know if I can give you an affiliate link for it without costing you more. I will. And uh, that's uh, one way you can support the show along with if you'd like to go to live.libertymeat.solutions, you can always tip me with lightning or whatnot. Uh, if you want to send me some Bitcoin, you can even go on the cash app and find me there at uh, Liberty Meat. And you can actually send me from your cash in Bitcoin. I prefer that. Uh, if you like what's going on, you want to help support this, about the, the time, the web uh, hosting and all the fun stuff, StreamYard subscriptions and everything that goes into keeping this podcast on the air and sharing this stuff with y'all. I do appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate you all signing up and following me. If you want to drop over to uh, YouTube, Odyssey or anything like that and follow me, that helps me out too. Uh, we're going to try to build that following up and uh, kind of get everything going there. So I appreciate everybody tuning in and listening to me ramble about uh, a subject that a lot of people are really uncomfortable with but hopefully you learned something from this i'm checking really quick to see if i had any questions or comments or anything like that to address before i wrap it up i don't see anything oh i do see uh sorry just now over a, a little bit ago over on twitch i see uh lang app one says uh, butter versus margarine which is better um i'm gonna say butter butter 100 margarine is actually partially hydrogenated vegetable oils there's a lot of evidence coming out to showing that regular vegetable oils and seed oils are not the best for us um i'm i won't say that i am keto carnivore i still do eat some carbs and things like that but i i know that that's a better path um i eat pretty heavy on the meat side myself probably mostly i have a few vices i drink a little beer here and there and uh, I, i'm not full keto but I will say most of the evidence that I'm seeing, especially from that side, is that no, <laughs> it's not the vegetable oils are not the best for us, especially when we have to turn around and pump them full of hydrogen gas and heat treat them and whatnot to get them to resemble something that is an actual animal product. I will say the butter that you get, if you can get it from a local source, if you have your own animals that you milk, that you can churn that butter even better. Um, there's ways to make your own butter. Uh, look, you don't want something that's chock full of a bunch of crap and preservatives and, and just junk. Don't buy the cheapest thing you can. If you want to buy it off a store shelf, try to find you something that's uh, like maybe European sweet cream butter. That's typically what I go for if I'm going for just a basic butter. I need to grab it and go. But, I mean, obviously good quality is ideal. You know. Um, so I, I typically avoid anything to do with margarine. Uh, same thing with shortening. Uh, like vegetable shortening, um, Crisco, no. 
I'll go with lard over that. Um, I prefer animal fats. I think they are the healthiest for you. They are the most flavorful. And if you have any question on whether it's flavorful, uh, flavorful, healthy for you or not, you have to consider um, if you've got to literally chemically modify a vegetable fat to make it resemble what is a natural fat from an animal, is it really healthier for you? And if it, if you feel like it's healthier for you, it's probably because you've been told that through advertisements and through doctors who have been kind of misled. And most of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are coming around to understanding that what was pushed down our throats for the longest times isn't the best. So um, if you're following this channel, hopefully you're not against meat. Hopefully you uh, kind of understand that uh, a healthy animal is going to be healthy for us to consume. So therefore any animal product that comes directly from the animal is going to be far healthier than a modified vegetable oil. So uh, thank you for the question. I'm glad that you, you popped in and hopefully that answers. If you have any follow-up or whatnot, be sure to shoot me a message or join us over on Telegram uh, at t.me slash Liberty Me chat. And it's a, it's a really cool uh, little community there. We've you, been floating around 50, 60 people. We've got a few scammers we've knocked out of there, but uh, it's really picked up, especially after Jack's show. And we've got a lot of people in there. Good conversation. Uh, we're a little goofy. We like to hang out and talk. So, uh, but there's, there's a lot of good, a uh, lot of good content in that group. So come check it out if you're interested. And uh, I'm going to wrap this show up, get the audio side up. I've got some uh, hamburger to grind and uh, not an ax to grind today, just a hamburger to grind. Uh, I've got to go get that knocked out and taken care of this afternoon. And uh, I'll be around if uh, you can't, you don't hear back from me right away. Just be patient. Shoot me a message on Telegram. Shoot me an email. I'll be right with you. And uh, be sure to tune into the future interviews and shows and be here next time. I will announce it when I know for sure that I'm going to do it for part two, where we go on to not leaving you hanging while you are hanging your animal. So uh, once again, thanks for tuning in and be free. Let's see how long it takes me to end this stream. There we go.